right. Once again, we welcome you to the Inspirited Network, and we ask that as we begin this Bible study that you'll bow your heads with us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. And now we ask that we read over the lesson for this week that you will guide our hearts and minds so that we will be not only more one, more one, more in one accord with you, but we will understand the things that you want us to learn that will draw us closer to thee and towards one another so that people can see that Jesus is living through us. Guide us and keep us this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Brother Spellman, good to have you back. Hello, everyone that's joined us. All right. We are looking at this week's lesson. It is Keys for a Happy Marriage. And, you know, marriage is a serious issue today. Hot, hot, hot topic. What is marriage? Who made marriage? Is the marriage a uh, religious-based thing or can any civil authority have control of it? Uh, what is the origin of marriage? So, you know, and, of course, what makes a happy marriage? So with these very hot topics, this right here is timely. So we're going to look at marriage from the biblical perspective. Because when you look, because truthfully, you know, I, I've done a lot of studies growing up, and I used to read a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, well, I guess ancient cultures, myths, and beliefs, and none of them, none of them review marriage as just a civil authority. They all agree that it has some spiritual implications, that when the creator of whatever their society, whoever he's, he was, they instituted marriage. So the Bible tells us that the God of the Bible institutes marriage, and let's look at how this plays out. Okay. We're looking at 17 rules for a happy marriage from God's great book. The number one is establish your own private home. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. God's rule is specific. A married couple must leave mother and father and establish their own home, even if finances require that it be a one-bedroom apartment. Husband and wife should decide together on such policies as these. Then she should inform her relatives, and he's going to do the same with his. They must remain firm no matter who opposes. Thousands of divorces would be avoided if this rule were carefully followed. You know, one of the biggest issues people have is their in-laws. Or uh, they're living in somebody else's house or somebody else's basement or apartment, and they haven't established their own home. When you have to worry about somebody else looking over you or being in your family business, they're going to have problems. So the, the Bible method is cle no, leave and cleave. I'm sorry, leave and cleave. Leave your parents' home and then grow tight, become one with your spouse. Otherwise, you're not, not, not going to be able to weather the storms that come when you are married. No way. Uh, number two is called continue your courtship. The Bible says, above all, hold unfailing your love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. That's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, in the Proverbs 31 woman that we see, um, verse 28 tells you that her husband praises her, that he sits in the gate and talks about her. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34, we find out that she that is married careth, and she knows how to please her husband. You know, there's nothing worse, and this goes for both men and women. There's nothing worse than when you're married to somebody and you're loving somebody and you stop doing the things that won them. You stop doing the things that make them feel that they care and matter. So we should continue that 
which brought us together in the first place. And we should be kindly affectionate one to another in honor, preferring one another or caring about another's needs more than our own. And that's Romans chapter 12, verse 10. You know, um, if you listen to anybody, you listen to TV, the stories, the, 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 the psychiatrist, um, any kind of counselor, women especially always say he doesn't do the things that he used to do. You know, we feel that we take him for granted. And this is what happens in marriage when, when the love grows cold or grows stale. We don't take the time to do that which won us in the first place. So this thing is very important that we have to love each other, that we have to showcase how much we care, that we'll spend time, and we'll do things that make the person that we're married to feel like they're still special, even after all this time together. Yeah, and, you know, um, what's interesting is that kind of couples with, uh, with number one as well, because, I mean, uh, when you add the added pressure, when, when you stop doing the things that won the person in the first place, and then you add the added pressure of the family dynamic because, you know, you, you choose to live with family members or, you know, with someone else who can uh, be a, um, a strain on the relationship, uh, it adds to the problems that makes them a lot harder to solve, especially when uh, the courtship uh, doesn't still exist. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, a father or a mother that um, is present in the home that causes uh, the lack of privacy, but it can be either a friend, it can be a, uh, a sibling, it can be another type of relative. Um, you know, anybody who, uh, basically like what the text I think is saying in Genesis 2.24 is that uh, they have to establish their own household in order to um, build this new family. And when you have a third party in there, that can be hard to do. Now, of course, there are those situations where a person can be sick and you have no other choice but you really want to establish that this is your household and that, you know, your customs and your traditions are going to be what, what, uh, what get followed. Yes. Very, yeah, very true. Yeah, very true. Um, you, know, when, you know, when you want to do things and learn to establish stuff for yourself, to have somebody else in the mix is just, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, even when you're dating, they say get rid of the third wheel or get rid of the fifth wheel. So why would you want that in your household when you're married? Anybody else have anything to say? Guess not yet. Okay. All right. Let's move on. The third one is remember that God joined you together in marriage. Once again, Jesus quotes. This is from Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. It says, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What, therefore, God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. See, once again, the religious aspects, the spiritual aspects of marriage have to do with your relationship to God. It says, has love almost disappeared from your home? The devil is a notorious homebreaker. He's responsible for the chaos that we allow to happen in our marriages. But don't forget that God himself joined you together in marriage, and he intends for you to stay together and be happy. He will bring happiness and love into your lives if you will obey his divine rules or his commandments. With God, all things are possible. Don't despair. God, who places love in the heart of a missionary, for a leprous savage can easily give you love for each other if you let him. This is the most important thing, I think, and this is one of the biggest issues. It seems that when people get married today, they, they may get married in the church, they may get married wherever, but they don't put God in, forget God in their vows. They don't put God in their lives. And without God, they cut off on some aspect the portion of love. The Bible says God is love. So when I marry my wife, I need God in there. 
Because when things get stale between, and sometimes they do get stale between two adults, uh, you go and, you know, you, you, you know, you have your own feelings and things, and you sometimes we forget to love each other. We need God to help kindle, help us remember that he brought us together, he can keep us, he can sustain us. This is some serious stuff. And, you know, divorce is at a, such a rate where for every two people that get married, two couples that get married, one of them is breaking up. So you're basically rolling dice in marriage because we don't take it seriously enough or we don't look at the full length picture and because we don't have God in the midst. And without God, you can do nothing. Okay. Number four says, guard your thoughts. Don't let your senses trap you. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's Proverbs 23, verse 7. And God has a particular warning in his Ten Commandments from Exodus 20, verse 17. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Proverbs 4, 23 asks us to keep our hearts with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And Philippians 4, verse 8, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatever, whatever so things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue in these things, think on these things. You know, um, the wrong kind of thinking will destroy a marriage. You know, um, you know, some people walk into marriage with the idea of a of a um, stipulation, uh, you know, you have a, um, what do you call it, you have little clauses and um, prenuptial agreements, you know, people walk into a marriage ready for annulment, they walk into marriage saying, oh, we can always get divorced, we actually treat marriage as if we're going to the store, and if we don't like it, we can return the item, that is not how God views marriage, so if we begin off with the wrong thought, that's bad enough. But sometimes because we feel that the grass may be greener on the other side or we have some issues that we haven't worked out in the marriage, we start looking in other places. And those other places always cause problems. In fact, you see it right now in the news, you have Donald Sterling, multi-millionaire, owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, basketball, Sport, um, sport, uh, uh, um, sport leader. That's all sure I can get for him because it's a, it's a mess. The man's been married for years, married for years, and yet every now and then he goes to court over some girlfriend. In fact, his latest girlfriend recorded one of his conversations, which now has him outside of the NBA and getting ready to lose his own franchise. So when you put yourself outside of marriage, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it will come back to haunt you. And we see this now. This is is something in the news. So this man, all his money, couldn't save his marriage or the ramifications of cheating on his wife. So this is some heavy stuff. And the Bible is saying if we put our thoughts in the right place, if we don't go chase after things that were not meant to be ours, if we don't love and cultivate that which God has already given us, we're asking for trouble. We're asking That's the for truth. problems. You know, and I, I would like to, uh, to add on to that because, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, what happens in, with people is that Satan always makes the grass look greener on the other side. And he constantly, especially in Christian relationships, because he especially tries to get you to notice uh everything that somebody else has right and everything that maybe your partner has wrong. And he does this in order to weaken the marriage relationship and make it appear as if it is impossible for God's will to be done between a married couple and that somehow uh, for whatever reason, the couple just cannot stay together and is destined for failure. And this other person has so much uh, that, you know, you really, think you need 
and it's, it's, it's deception because, you know, while you think um, you may be getting everything you want, you come to realize that, hey, wait a minute, this person isn't even as good as my spouse. Or even if the person was, there's so much trouble and so much problems that are attached to that situation that it makes it not even worth it. So, you know, it, it's uh, interesting that you brought up the, um, the current event because, you know, people – uh, are, are constantly being tempted, and then they're losing out. They're losing their fortune. They're losing so much um, just because of one little compromise. And, uh, you know, one of the person, I mean, I think one of the most qualified individuals to speak on this subject was King Solomon. Yes. And Solomon had some warnings about guarding your thoughts and not allowing your senses to trap you um, when you're tempted by someone of the opposite sex. And I, wa- I want to just share a few, a few verses if I can. Okay, go right ahead. Um, the first one is uh, Proverbs chapter 5. And it says, My son, attend unto wisdom, and bow, thine, and, and bow thy, thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of, of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto the others, and thy years unto the cruel. So when I look at that text, you know, think about what Solomon's really saying here. He's saying that when you look at another woman, someone that you're not, Uh, to have a relationship with. Everything about her appears wonderful and good and perfect as if it's everything you want. You know, he he says here in in, uh, verse 3, her lip, the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. A honeycomb is sweet. Everybody wants a honeycomb. And her mouth is smoother than oil. I mean, it just looks smooth. I mean, it looks like it's everything you could possibly want. It's better than everything else. How, How did you not notice it in the first place? But then it says, but her end is bitter as wormwood and sharp as a two-edged sword. So she's taking you down the wrong path. She's taking you down the path of destruction. But because you see her at first and see the, 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 the lips of, that are smoother than oil or the mouth that drops like a honeycomb, you don't realize that you're going down to destruction. And then what, what really caught my attention, which gets at you know, what we were talking about in regard to not allowing your senses to trap you. What really gets it is, is verse 6, because it says here that lest thou shouldest ponder the, uh, the path of life, her ways are movable, which means that when, when, when somebody is trying to attract you and seduce you to get you away from your spouse, they appear as if they're everything that, that, that you want because their ways are movable, and they're movable because they change everything up so that they can fit perfectly with you. You like basketball? Yeah, I love basketball. You like Italian restaurants? Yeah, I love Italian. Oh, wow, this person has everything I ever wanted. You know, how could not I have noticed her before? So she changes based on you so that she can attract you. And she's movable so that you can't really know what she's really about and where she's really coming from until it's too late. So what does Solomon say to do? Remove your way far from her and don't even come near the door of her house. Don't go near her. So just um, that's just one of several texts uh, coming from somebody who would know and who had many uh, strange uh, women and strange wives and, and uh, had the experience. And now, from a standpoint of knowing better, Solomon gives this, this wisdom so that others after him don't make the same mistakes that he did. You don't want to uh, allow your senses to trap you, you have to guard your thoughts because even though you think something might be a, a good idea, everything that glitters is not gold. 
brother, you don't said about the last of two. That um, you know, uh, even looking at the Samson, you know, the first woman that he sees that's good looking, I want to marry her. You know, he hasn't spent any time with her. The woman later later um can't even keep her her trust on keeping an issue of a of a riddle. You know, but we chasing after stuff because just about the way it looks. Looks alone cannot help us. You know, so you don't want to know, let's go. And I like how you did the movable part. That was very good. I thought that was very good. You know, it's just it's a, it's a switch up campaign. It's like just like um, Jezebel. Jezebel thought Jay saw Jay who was coming. She put some makeup on as if that was going to change the um, the end all be all of things. And yeah, this is like I said, it's a hot topic right now. It is. I mean, and what's funny about it is like you know you can see the same thing happening in movies. You see the same thing happening you know amongst teenagers. The same thing happening amongst adults, and unfortunately, even people involved in in in, uh, in ministry uh, sometimes uh, fall to the seductiveness of some women. And sometimes you got to realize that um, you can't allow your senses to uh, trap you into thinking that you know this is okay and this is really everything you want. Because remember that Satan is out to is out to deceive, and one of the ways that he does deception is by causing us to become unsatisfied and discontent. And then from that dissatisfaction and from that discontent, he can show you what you might think is a better option and dress it up to be so nice, like it's everything you want. And then once you take hold of it, it brings about your destruction. Preach. <laughs> All right. Number five, it says, never retire for the night angry with, with each other. It says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Uh, confess your faults one to another, James five sixteen, And forgetting those things which are behind, Philippians 3, 3 verse 13. Uh, you know, uh, let me go back to Donald Sterling again for a moment. Um, you know, we had a discussion last week about Donald Sterling and this whole video, uh, well, audio tape um, fiasco. And, you know, this is not the first time that uh, he's been to court or had charges or some kind of issue brought up about his infidelity. But what I find amazing is that, you know, they list his wife as the estranged person, but definitely call the other person his girlfriend. Wow. So, so, so with this idea of going to bed angry or letting the sun go down upon your wrath and forgetting the things which are behind, somewhere along the line, even with all that money, with all that ability to do certain things together or go places, they have not left certain things behind. They left each other behind. They've become estranged. Wrath, um, their wrath at night has not been subsided. So he can be estranged from his wife, mm -hmm. yet get in trouble with his girlfriend. Wow. And, it, it, you know, it's... it's, it's you know that you know that statement amazed me. You know, you you, you know you normally say, um, you know, the man cheated, and he ain't like trying to pat you up. You know, you put it, you put her estranged in that way. But it's it's made to seem as if, plus they're not together. The wife is doing her thing, he's doing his, but he's still with the girlfriend. You know, um, another text just came to mind. Uh, and this is this is actually the next chapter from the one that I just read, uh, and it's Proverbs chapter six, and I want to start with verse twenty-four. And for those of you guys who just joined us, um, we're talking about keys to a happy marriage, and um, particularly how you have to guard your senses uh, and guard your thoughts 
against even thinking about another person uh, other than your spouse because Satan attempts to tempt us in that area. But here's Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 24. It says, to keep thee from the evil woman. Actually, no, let me start with verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. And reproof of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So is he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. So when I look at that text, and I think about the individual who you were just mentioning, it tells us here that God's commandments are a lamp. His law is a light to us. And his reproofs and his instruction can keep us in the way of life. But if one allows a woman to either flatter, because sometimes it's, it's, it's flirtation that takes place with the tongue. And what, what, let's, take, let's take a look at, at the flirtation for a minute. You know, sometimes it's just that maybe your spouse isn't complimenting you enough. Maybe your spouse isn't building you up. Maybe your spouse isn't giving you uh, that recognition or that respect that you think that you, that you deserve. And so when somebody else gives it to you and they're saying great things about you and they're saying, oh, you know, you're so handsome or, oh, you're so this, oh, you're so great, and you get flattered with the tongue, then, you know, you, you start heading down the wrong path. And it says here, bless not after her beauty in thine heart. Don't ponder it. Don't think about how beautiful this person is. And don't let her take you with her eyelids. And it says here that through the influence of a woman, a man is, bought, is, is brought to a piece of bread, in other words, brought down to basically nothing, and almost even to the point of having his, his, his life taken, taken away. And Solomon compares it to a person taking fire in their bosom or uh, putting hot coals on their feet. And like you said, Solomon should know. Solomon had enough drama in his life to know, hey, more than one woman is an issue. More than one woman is a problem. And, you know, um, as, men, as men in general, we are, um, we are trained on two basic grounds. Be a man. Do manly things. Get a job. Help your people out. Do this, do that. That's great. And the other side is be a man. Sow your wild oats. Be a man. Go conquer. Well, if you're telling me to be responsible on one end, but then go and be irresponsible on the other and conquer, how do I learn to treat the woman with respect and value and, and trust and, 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 and more than just a piece of property? How do I look at her as somebody special to keep? Because if I don't treat her right, my eye will wander. My mind will, you know, play. And like you said, that flattery game is something serious. Because you can feel good until somebody flatters you. What I mean by that is that you can feel everything is okay, but you got this person always saying the same thing to you, and it makes you and it, and it brushes up your ego a little bit. Oh, that'll mess you up. Yeah. And, and, and Solomon says, "Yes, yeah. sorry, go ahead. So go ahead. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead, bro. Go ahead." Yeah, I was gonna say, and Solomon says, uh, looking back at chapter five, that once a person has been brought to this destruction. Uh, in verse 12, it says, and, and the person will say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? And I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. And then his advice, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. So here, you know what? I mean, I'm even going to read the next two parts of the verses because this is important. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be thy, thine own and not, and not the strangers with thee. 
Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Now, what is this really saying to us here? It's telling us that a person, when they commit adultery, can be in the midst of all evil, even though they may not have intentionally started out that way, not, in, not intended to go down that path. And the reason why they, they fell into this problem was because they hated instruction. A lot of times when people think that they're in love, they hate instruction. They don't want to listen when somebody says, that, that person is, might not be good for you. Uh, you might want to think twice about this. Uh, are you sure? Why don't you proceed with a little more caution? Why don't you give this a little bit more time? People don't want to hear it. They hate and despise instruction. And so, but then when something goes wrong, they say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me? And so Solomon gives us wisdom here. He tells us, rather than go through that, Drink waters out of your own cistern. Now, what does he mean by the cistern? He's talking about from those who are of your faith, those who are um, like-minded with you, those who you can start a, a relationship with and build a family with. You drink waters out of your own system. Don't, don't go, to, don't go uh, sharing cisterns with other people. You don't want to go to your neighbor's cistern. You want your own. And he says that the, in, in verse 18, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the, the, with the wife of, your, of, your, of thy youth. In other words, be content. Don't go looking for other things. It's not what it's cracked up to be. And, and let me add this. You also read where it said that not to let your water end up running in the streets. Right. Don't let your wrong idea break your well of water. Don't let your wrong thoughts or your lust come in and destroy what was good at home where now the water that was sustaining you is now running down the street. Don't lose out on your blessing. Go back to your, what are you saying? Go back to your wife. Yeah. Go back and you enjoy know, that. And we, we as people have to understand, especially as followers of Christ, that we can't allow ourselves to be controlled by animal passion. You see, because the world teaches, if it feels good, do it. And if, 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 um, you know, if you want something, go for it. Regardless of the consequences, you know, you only live once, try it. You know, that, that's, that's a wrong concept because it, it, it's very costly. And so we have to be in control of our passions and our thoughts and our feelings and our senses rather than allowing them to be uh, manipulated by the enemy and then to get us in trouble that we can't get ourselves out of. It, it's better to control that passion and to have your rational mind control even your lust, even your passion, rather than letting that go uh, where, you know, it can cause bigger problems. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, you said it best. In fact, they even have a show on TV, and I don't watch it, but I see people post about it, he would talk about it. It's a show called Scandal, and apparently, at least for one season, it was about a woman who was sleeping with the President of the United States, and this should have been, this should have been um, a show that was torn down for debauchery, a show that's just torn down for um, promoting uh, promiscuity and um, intermarital affairs or extramarital affairs. So the president is a married character. But instead people love it and say, Oh, I gotta see what happens next. Oh, I gotta call in, I gotta you know, I gotta I gotta log in. I can't talk to you now. Scandal's on. So we look for the scandal as if there is something good in it. You know, I you know that's that's the truth too. I mean you know it's glorifying sin and, and, and because we glorify sin and, be, and because we are, we are so entrenched in this, this culture of, of uh, irresponsible passion, it is causing us to destroy the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. Because you, don't, you have not just shows like Scandal, but you have all kinds of stuff out there. Um, you know, and even the books. You know, as, a, as a teacher, I see sometimes the books that these kids are reading 
and these books glorify deviant sexual behavior. And so when you, when you practice reading and, and infusing the mind with deviant sexual thoughts, then what happens is that you begin to think on and ponder those things because that's your entertainment. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so as, as you begin to ponder these deviant thoughts, you might even be tempted to practice these deviant thoughts. But even if you don't practice them, the thought is still there. And then so through practicing and, and the, the, uh, the nurturing of that kind of, um, that kind of entertainment, then when you get into your marriage relationship, what do you expect from your partner? What happens if your partner is not able to perform those things? It, it, it's tearing our, our culture from marriage apart. Yeah, you know, and 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 marriage is a heart is the heartbeat of a community, which is the heartbeat of a nation, and so this attack on marriage is very very systematic, very very planned because it destroys families, and this is why this this one asks us to read Ephesians chapter four verse thirty two, be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, we don't like to forgive. We like to hold on to stuff, like like it's some kind of credit card or something. Like, oh, I know that time you did this. Listen, hey, you remember when I did some right stuff? You remember? Can we love one another? You want to be loved, but you can't show me love. You want to be forgiven, but you can't for, but you can't forgive me. And this is why divorce has become like. There was a time when getting a divorce was like literally the last straw. Now. I get divorced. That's like a first reaction now. Matt, as you said, from from deviant behavior sexually to the lack of respect and love on the other side, we have allowed a culture of divorce. And, and in fact, in fact, um, you know, there are a lot of jobs that would be non-existent if we had a sin-free life or if we stayed under God's guidance by his Ten Commandments. Um, one of those jobs would be lawyers. And some lawyers make buku money off divorce court. That's a popular TV show. If we weren't so in love with doing things our way instead of God's way, that would never be a show on TV. There would be less divorce lawyers. But we have steered we have steered away from God's commandments and respect and love for one another, and that's this is the result. And that leads to the next one. It says, "Keep Christ in the center of your home." And I'm going to try and tie it for the next one. It says, "Well, this one paper verses Psalm 127 verse one: Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it." Proverbs chapter Amen. 3, verse 6. Beautiful. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Go ahead, Brother Spellman. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, um, here's, when you really think about it, a lot of people make excuses for doing the wrong thing, and they say, oh, it's just a book, or oh, it's just a TV show, oh, it's just, you know, a movie, it's not that serious, just because we watch it, just because we pay attention to it, it doesn't mean that we're going to do it. But then if, if we're really being honest with ourselves and, um, you know, we think, it, it, I mean, Jesus himself taught that you, you reap what you sow. And if you, if, you re, if you start sowing a seed for something and you sow it over and over and over again, you're going to eventually reap the harvest of the seed that you planted. And so if you constantly sow in evil thoughts, you constantly sow in thoughts of, of, of sin or violence or murder or sex, and you and you sow in you know uh, thoughts of, uh, of of lust and deviant uh, in, in sexual behavior. Eventually, that's going to be what you reap in one way or another. Everybody might not reap the harvest of, of the seeds they sow in the same exact way, but the point is that at some point we all reap it. Yes, and I, I just said earlier. Um, 
that what you put in your mind will come back to you. So this is what we, you know, we taught. We, and since we're, since we're very visual creatures, especially men, this thing has a playback in our head. That's why pornography is such a big thing. That's why, you know, people um, go to the movies because they want the visual effect. So now we have things on TV and where it once was taboo or is once was sin, we don't see it that way no more. Right. Uh, we have a comment that just came in here. It says, um, okay. I concur with the speaker. We need to keep Christ in the center of our lives. When we have mates, we have to keep Christ in the vessel at all times and lean on him for instruction and direction for all that is good for us. Yes. Um, if we would follow the, the um, if we would follow the the ideas of marriage that we find in the Bible, um, and how to treat one another, how to love one another, we would eliminate a lot of the problems. If we would um, seek God's guidance, because the next question is, the, the next one is pray together. If we would put God in the middle of everything that we would do, we would see better results because we would be acting under the auspices of God himself instead of our own actions. You know, a few years ago they had that, those beads that people wore and those bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And, you know, now we try to do everything that Jesus wouldn't. You know, we don't spend the time together. We don't have intimacy that's proper. We don't have worship together. We don't do things that bind us uniquely to each other and to God. And then when somebody else comes along, all we know is pleasure. Now, the Bible does not lie about pleasure. Sin can feel good for a moment, but it's only for a season. And you'll find that in Hebrews chapter 11, that sin is only good, pleasurable for a season. After that, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So basically what I'm doing is having a good time and destroying myself. Jesus put it another way. Uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and then to lose your soul? So marriage is supposed to be an institution that is to reflect your relationship with Christ and it's supposed to last forever. He never desired for it to be broken. And the thing is the intimate thing that, that, that should be done are supposed to reflect the intimacy you have with God. Now, let me let me tie that in. I'm, I'm first going to read this from Pray Together. It says, Matthew 26, verse 41, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So in other words, we need help beyond ourselves. My flesh is weak. My spirit may want to be on the right path, but my flesh is weak. So I've got to pray, communicate, talk with God for having power so I don't fall into temptation. James chapter 5, verse 16, says that we should pray one for another. another. And James James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. So God is saying, stop trying to do your own thing. I'm here to give you what you need. The same God that can give me wisdom can help me fix my marriage. Amen. So if we would keep God in the center and then pray together, read together, do the little things that I'm not going to do with anybody else, it will draw. Listen, let me tell you something about Oh, man, I, I, I just want to jump into this. Intimacy is an aspect of worship. Hmm, that's deep. When you don't have special time together, the worship experience dies. When you're married, you don't have this kind of intimacy, the, it, the, the, relationship, the relationship starts to die. The, the Bible puts worship and intimacy together because Jesus says, I have loved you with an everlasting love in one text, and another he says, you have played the harlot by going after other gods. So your fidelity 
your trust, your intimacy is connected to your relationship. And marriage is an institution that's supposed to copy that. So here we are wondering why we can't get it right with God and then understand why we can't get it right with our spouses. Because we don't spend the time, we don't put in the energy anymore, we don't love one another, we don't talk about things without going to bed angry, we don't pray together, we don't lift each other up, and we don't encourage each other. So when you go home, now home becomes a burden. And you can't hate to hear those flattering flattering lips. But that stuff is temporary. You know, when, you have, when you're married and you get a divorce, you carry those scars for life. It's true. And God wanted marriage to be a blessing. Eve was supposed to be Adam's help meet. In other words, help him meet whatever challenge of the day he was going to go through. He supposed to do the same thing up, to lift each other up, encourage one another, be together, be each other's strength. But we don't treat marriage like that anymore. Uh, Thomas just came in. Good afternoon. Uh, Marriage is just now an uh, an act of convenience. In fact, I remember reading a report some years ago that some people are getting married not just because they love each other, but because it's better for them financially. Mm. Comment just came in. Uh, It says here, we must fast with the prayer as well. Uh, this is in response to what you were saying earlier about uh, praying about uh, the relationship. So it says that we must fast with the prayer as well. The fast with the prayer is like an atomic weapon. Yes. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, um, once again, you go back to the, to the you know, um, now this could be individual or it could be together, um, the fasting issue. But the more things that you do together, the more you are empowered for each other. So I agree. It could be in a time of what because the fasting takes other things out of the way. The prayer puts you, listen, I don't care what you believe. If you're talking about prayer, you're talking about something spiritual. So that means you're looking for someone else to help you out. I believe it's Christ Jesus. So we're looking for the higher authority, the one who ordained marriage, to come and step in. So I give God room to do his to do his will in my life. You're asking for power. And that's a good thing because most people get married and they do it under their own power and wonder why they fail. Here we have power from on high that can sustain us. Listen, any marriage that's been 20 years or better will tell you they've been through some rocky roads. And they had to do some things a little differently or go back to the basics in order to keep the marriage alive. Listen, you're going to have to go through something. Nothing worth having doesn't go without fighting for it. And part of our fight is return to the one who always wins, and that's Jesus. Bring him back into the marriage. Fast and pray and seek his face and look out for the benefit of one another. And that will improve the marriage life because if you, even if you watch the movies, they tell you there's, a, there's, a, there's an eighty twenty rule. Eighty percent of all that you need, they some of them say, is what you have at home. Twenty percent of what this. you want is out in the street. However, however, as you read earlier, uh, um, for a woman will bring a man to a morsel of bread. That twenty percent can have him lose more than half of what he has from the beginning. Sometimes they lose it all. It's not worth it. The trade off doesn't help. The odds are not in your favor when you go outside of your marriage. It just doesn't work. And number eight says that we need to agree that divorce is not the answer. The Bible says this, and this is what I this is this is something that I always love. Matthew nineteen verses six and in verse seven. Verse six says. What therefore God have joined together, let no man put asunder. So Jesus is telling you that you should not be split up. And it reinstates that. Verse 9 says this, Whosoever shall put his wife 
put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So God is saying, listen, I never wanted you to separate. I want you to stay together. And Romans 7 verse 2 emphasizes that. It says, the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as she liveth. Marriage is forever. And God never, ever wanted to have divorce. In fact, he, Jesus, Jesus tells them that divorce was allowed because of the hardness of your heart. It was not so from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So God's design is not separate. Matter of fact, if that was the case, Jesus wouldn't have a reason to want to come and die for us because he could, he could just say, oh, they sinned, let me divorce them. But it says, he says, no, I love you. It's like a bride. It's like the bridegroom loving his bride. He will chase after us until he can win us back. So if that's the kind of love he has for us, what kind of love should we showcase for our spouses? A uh, comment just came in here. It says, uh, it certainly helps to take self out of the way. Uh, yes, Jesus has to step in to give us power to overcome in order to be united. Yes. yes. I mean, yes. <laughs> what I can say is yes. Um, and, and, and your first statement is that, 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 was that it helps self get out the way. That's the problem. And I think that sometimes, even for me at times, you know, um, I had been a bachelor for a while before I decided to get decided I was decided to marry. Um, we have to conquer the self issue. We have to have God help us conquer um, our own personal stuff that gets in the way of the whole of our marriage or the whole of our family. And it's not wrong to want certain things for you, but when it's all about you and you have somebody else uh, in line, something is wrong with your thinking. It's about how can I love this person enough to let them see that I, I cherish them, I desire them, I will do things for them, and then in return, out of love, that person should do things for you. It becomes a um, the best kind of symbiotic relationship where you literally feed off each other in the love, in the love um, area. You give, they give. You give, they give. You can't outbeat each other's giving because all you do is give to each other. You sacrifice for one another. Uh, Jesus says, greater love hath no man that he laid down his life for his friends. The husband, by definition, is the house band. He's the one that tightens everything together. He will sacrifice so that his wife and his family will have things that they need, even if he has to go without. But we don't see that anymore. Oh, we don't see that as we should. That's not promoted anymore. Well, the man might work a job that he might not like, but he's going to make sure his wife and his kids are taken care of. Um, you know, he may feel a certain way, but he says, listen, I, I'm going to hold that back because my main goal is to make sure you eat or that you're taken care of. Well, people will sacrifice for one another and reach out to help one another. But we don't see that anymore. So now there's a deterioration in the family and a de- deterioration in the marriage, and the two major things that you hear from husband and wives are, for husbands, I don't feel respected, and women, I don't feel loved. So when those two things are attacked or la- allowed to die, the marriage bond breaks, and self becomes number one. But the best thing you can do for yourself, the Bible says, is to love your wife. Paul reminds us that no man, no man that's in his right mind hates his own body and wants to kill himself. So you should love your wife because your wife becomes one with you. Hmm. You know, uh, a question just came in. I, found, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, it says, is it possible to be unequally yoked in the same denomination? Yes. You want to know how? Absolutely. I can give you one example right now. Here's an example. 
you both can be in the same denomination, but if they don't believe the way you believe, you're unequally yoked. If they don't have the same passion for the gospel based on your denomination that, that you have, you're unequally yoked. You can have the same core values, but if you're the active one in the movement and they're the one that, don't, that doesn't want to do anything, they're unequally yoked. It's going to be an issue. Um, you know, uh, when, when I was getting married, when I, when, I, when I was going through my counseling, uh, the minister told me, they counseled me, he said, you need to have enough things alike to keep you together, to keep you um, on one page, to keep you with one idea to move forward, and enough things in, that are different to keep things spicy, to, you know, allow us to learn from one another. But if you come in and you believe the same thing, um, the same basic, the only other basic core is this. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, that's great. Anybody can anybody can pass that test. But if you are about spreading the gospel and your spouse is about sitting at home, you're going to have a problem. If you're about being active in church and they could care less, you're going to have a problem. You know, there are many people that come to church and their spouses say we believe the same thing, but you only see one um, one side of the family in church. So you can't, and that's just one simple example. You can be equal, you can be unequally yoked in church. You can have one core belief and then they think something else, and that will cause division in your house. Right. You know, I, I agree. And, you know, it, it comes down to uh, two things I want to I wanna add to what you were saying. You know, a person can say they believe something and they can say, okay, hey, you know, we're all part of the same denomination. You know, we're all, we, all, we both go to the same church. But uh, what do their actions demonstrate? Because in James chapter 2, starting at verse 19, James had this to say. He said, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So even the devil believe in God. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So a person can profess belief in something. They can, on paper, belong to a particular denomination or a particular church. But in practice, you find out that it's something else. And that brings me to the other comment that I was going to make in regard to conviction. So being yes. equally yoked, is more than just attending the same church and the same uh, denomination or, or what have you. It also has to do with having the same level of conviction. And convictions play a big role in marriages in a variety of ways. For example, how do you raise the children? What is, what is your policy when it comes to church? Do we take an active role in ministry? Do we keep the Sabbath from sunset to sunset, or is it okay to go out to a restaurant? Um, how do we keep the Sabbath at all? Um, you know, this, this, I mean, and even in other areas, I mean, when it, when it comes to ministry, you know, are all types of ministry okay? There, you have to be on the same page in terms of levels of conviction in order for things to work out. Because if they want to head one way, and somebody else wants to head another way, it's just not going to work. Even, but what do you believe about, about your fundamental beliefs in, in the church? If one person believes in a more charismatic style of worship, while the other one believes in a, in a different style, that can cause problems. Not that you can't have individual preferences. I'm not talking about preferences for certain things, or maybe like for a particular song or a particular preacher. But if everything is so stark contrast, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? And, it, and that, that's, that's a beautiful question because um, you know, I mean, I know people who are married in in in, in the churches, and they're unequally yoked. They're trying to work it out, but they're unequally yoked. You know, um, one person says they love God and believe this, and the person says love their God, love they love God, and 
They're out on left field. And they think the things they do is okay with God. And so in the church, you can have different levels of, like John to the best, levels of conviction. If you both start out one way, you're trying to go, that's fine. But, you know, if you're on two different pages completely when it comes to your your views and how you live them out, how you act them out, it's going to be seen. My wife and I do not always agree on the same exact thing. My wife and I may have different ideas of how we do certain things, but we will agree that certain things need to be done, that we need to move in this direction for the benefit of the family or the benefit of the church. At least in that, okay, we have something to work. There's some common ground there. You know, you may say red, I may say blue, but if we're both looking for the couple that's going to motivate, that's fine. But if you want to turn the page on me and not be involved or we're not together supporting one another, you have an issue. So, yes, you can be. You can be unequally yoked in the church. Okay. Uh, it says here, uh, thank you for your response. So we have to have God's spirit guiding us continually. Uh, yeah, I would say amen to that. You know, um, I think yeah. about um, how Abraham wanted to choose a wife for um, for uh, Isaac. And uh, he prayed and then he sent his servant and before the servant could choose the right person for him, he prayed and said, okay, Lord, I don't know who to choose here. I don't know who's going to be right for my master's son. So you guide me toward the right woman. And whoever feeds, uh, whoever waters both, uh, for, uh, sorry, whoever gives me water and waters all the camels that are with me, I'll know that that's the right person. And the likelihood of someone actually doing those things was very uncommon because it was a lot of work. So it had to be a really kind-hearted and tender person to accomplish something like that. It wouldn't be just anybody. So the fact that the right person was there at the right time and, and offered to water, uh, to give him water and the water for the camels and all the, the, uh, the animals that he had with him uh, spoke volumes about her character um, and allowed him to know that God had directed him to the right person. That's right. And he asked for specific things, so specific needs that he knew would be good for Isaac. You know, sometimes we don't get specific enough for God. We see somebody, oh, she's fine. That's it. She's fine. Oh, he's so good. And, and, it, and it works both ways, too, because women think that towards certain men, you know, certain certain, yeah. certain guys. Oh, will be like, you know, good he's, looking. Oh, he's a rebel. Oh, this, you know. and, and that's it. That's, that's the criteria right there. No, no, no ambition, no goals, no none of that stuff that's good for me, but they're fine. They're good. That's all that matters. And that wears thin after a while. You know, so, um, and taking on with that, this is important because when we properly put each other in its proper perspective, in, in the proper perspective, in fact, we agree that divorce is not the answer, that we pray together, that we uh, keep Christ the center of our home. It will allow us to keep the family close, close and tightly. You know, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. I won't do anything that will break up the happy home. Uh, that's Exodus 20, verse 14. Proverbs 31, 11 and 12 says, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She will do good, do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So here we are. Um, we're coming to the point where we should be able to walk around and trust one another, have confidence in one another, that my best interest is what they have. And Malachi 2.14 says, The Lord has been witness between thee and thy wife or thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. So in other words, God is like, listen, uh, um, God is watching. Don't do the wife of your youth, the one that you've spent all these years in time with. Don't do her dirty because she's actually a reflection of you. Matter of fact, there's energy released when you are with your wife, and I and I can I can I, I you know I can prove it biblically. I can prove it biblically. Solomon reigned for forty years. 
in Israel. Scholars believe that he was somewhere between uh, teenage years, maybe not quite 20, 21, when he ascended to the throne. So somewhere between 14 and 18, 14 and 20 years old before he got to the throne. He was still a young man. Um, He reigned 40 years. And he did not die of, of from battle. His body just really gave out because he had he had seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. He withered himself away. Now imagine if he did not wither himself away, how long might he have reigned? You know, just a few years ago, we have someone like Wilt Chamberlain. Now I'm, I'm into basketball, so you have these two greats. You have Wilt Chamberlain. And you have Bill Russell. They're about the same age. Um, Will Chamberlain looked haggard. He died about 68, 69. He looked haggard. He bragged he had 10,000 lovers. This man just up and died. Energy is gone. It's released. Let go of. Meanwhile, uh, um, uh, Russell's still around. You know, hear about him infidelity. He still looks good for a man in the 70s. He still looks like he's a vibrancy. And the Bible warns us that we need to cleave to our wife, become one, or stay with them. Matter of fact, science even tells you that when you lay with more than one person, you give up a part of yourself. So why would we want to give up our marriage, give up our families, give up ourselves, by dividing ourselves with everybody else. I think a comment just came in. Um, hold on one second. Okay, and it says here... Um, What should be done then if it is discovered that one, meaning that uh, a couple finds themselves, is unequally yoked in the same space? Does this mean problem continually? It means it's time to work. It means it's time to pray and time to work. Um, The same way that we try to find out each other's interests on secular levels. Or what what does she like? What color does she like? Um, what kind of dress? Uh, yeah, does she like this kind of thing? Food? Uh, other interests? Is the same way we need to find in the Bible, find in our faith, the things that will spark the interest, that will motivate them, so that we can be on the same page, or at least with the same uh, motivation. Spiritually, because here's the thing. I'm trying to go to heaven. I hope my wife is not only in love with me, but is in love with Jesus, and that her goal is the one to go to heaven. But if that is not the case, then I need to find out and work with that, because you're going to end up like Lot. You're running towards the mountain, or in this case, the city Zor, and she's looking back. Or you're like Nabal and Abigail. I'm looking out Abigail for the best interest so David doesn't kill us, and Nabal is so stupid, he's ready to set David off and end my life. That is a form of unequally yoked. And the interest levels, the things that should that should bind us together are not the same. So we need to work on pray, talk to the Lord. Lord, help us that you will revive us again and find the interest level. Some people are interested in prophecy. Let's see if that works. Some people are interested in doing Dorcas work, where they go out and help people do something in their hands. Some people are into the health ministries and various things. We need to find that thing, that niche. Use your gifts your spiritual gifts, and see that which can be best cultivated 
so that the people will have a sparked interest. You know, I want to I want to add to that by by putting in a biblical uh, basis for what we're saying right here, and that comes from First Corinthians chapter seven, and I want to start with uh, with verse twelve, and it says, "But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, so this wife is an unbeliever, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him." So this is in the case of the person who's already married. So this doesn't mean that you marry somebody who is uh, an unbeliever. If you if you are if you started out as an unbeliever, um, and you happen to, and then later on you later became a, a believer, and your spouse still doesn't believe, that's that's the situation with this text. So it's not a license to marry an unbeliever, but it's for uh, it's information. It's it's a it's a uh, uh, directive for someone who is in a relationship and comes to be a believer. So anyway, it says, And if the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So in other words, don't end the relationship. For the unbelieving right. husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving no. departs, so in other words, the person wants to leave, they don't want to be a part of the relationship, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to teach. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So it's telling okay. us that through your now, hold on. I want you to go back to the other text where it says that they're sanctified. The unbeliever is sanctified by who? By the believing spouse. Okay, so God respects your marriage vow so much. He respects your desire for your spouse so much that he sheds his grace on the unbeliever because of you. Now, that goes back to what I was saying before. If we would spark the interest, there are people who I know have never been to church, and that the years, they finally come in because of the love that their spouse had for them. So it can be worked on. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead, brother Selvin. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, go ahead. I was, uh, that's what I was saying. Uh, I think someone else wanted to say something. Go ahead. Okay, so here, uh, thank you for clarifying that point. Okay, all right. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I thank you, Brother Selman, because, listen, I, if if I worship a God that can do anything, he can definitely save my marriage. Now, of course, as Brother Selman just read, that the unbeliever has got to want to continue in this pathway, but like that's why I said we spark the interest, we show them that we love them, showcase that there are people who I've seen join the church based on how their spouse has loved them into it. And I've seen them become active for the Lord. But they wouldn't do a thing beforehand. Now they're active for the Lord. So God can change that around too. He can take the unequal and make it right. But it's a dangerous road when we know only go down that path. Exactly. And, you know, I would add to that just by saying, you know, and that's why we got to be so careful about the way we act as Christians around an unbelieving spouse. Because if you act like the devil at home, but you, be, but you, but you play holy at church, then your husband is not going to buy your witness. You know, so Ooh. in order for you to be a believer and to, and to reach and win the members of your family that are not believers, then you have to live Christ especially in your household so they might be won by your good conduct and desire to have the same relationship with Jesus that you have because they see something special in your life. You know, it's funny you say that because I'm thinking now of the guy who uh, who, who made these, um, um, oh, what is it, the In Search Of series, um, like In Search Of a Creator, um, in search of Jesus, uh, 
Lee Strobel, Lee Strobel. And this is a man who was a self-professed atheist for years. You know, he did some lawyer work, worked work with the police department and other things, and he was a self-professed atheist, and his wife was basically atheist too, agnostic. And then one day she started going back to church, and she got serious, and he thought that her going back to church and him not being a churchgoer would cause problems in his marriage. So he, so he says that the best thing that ever happened to him was his wife going back to church. Because he watched her change, and her change began to affect him. And now he's a full-fledged believer in Jesus, where he once was an atheist. Once believed in evolution, now he believes in creation. And, and he has a, you can look on YouTube, or you can, you, can, you can buy his DVDs or get his books. He has a bunch of things that are now all pro-Jesus. And the witness of his wife, showcased Christ in a different light and invited him into the church. So there are things that can be done in our marriages if we let God step in and have his way. Question just came in. Uh, let's say that while I was in the world that I got married more than once. The marriages did not work. Then I became a Christian. Can I get married now that I, that I understand marriage much better? Good question. Um, okay. Good question. Let me look at the Bible for a moment. Um, number one. Number number one. Let me let me first say this. The Book of Acts in chap, chapter seventeen tells us that in the time of our ignorance, God winks at our ignorance. But once we come into the knowledge of understanding, that's what we're going to be judged on. God is going to be fair. God's laws are universal, but for that which we don't know, he will not be as harsh with us as that which we do know. So if you did not know the proper attitude for marriage, there is a possibility for you to, you know, have that winking. That's in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. At the time of this ignorance, God winked at it, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. So your goal now is to repent. Ask God for forgiveness. Now there are two things that can happen. According to the uh, according to, to what Paul wrote in First Corinthians, it is better to marry than to burn. Let's just put it out there. It, it, it is our natural desire to have relation with somebody, to be one with somebody, to be close and drawn and intimate with somebody. So if you now that proper marriage perspective, you need to find someone who will be equally yoked with you and understand your issue, that you surrender these things to Jesus, and you work together so that you can stay together. Let's not compound my ignorance with um, evil deeds. And right now, I'm looking for the other text that, that can help me with what I'm, I'm, you know, I have an idea where it is, but I want to make sure that I say it right to you. Um, what does it start with? I should be able to pull it up pretty quick. What's that? I'm sorry. I said, what does it start with? I should be able to pull it up pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, well, I'm looking for it right now. Um, oh gosh. I want to say it's First Corinthians six that I'm looking. What was the uh, the gist of what it said? Okay, okay I'm sorry. It's First Corinthians seven. Okay. First, first Corinthians seven. Um, it started with um, verse nine. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. And unto them I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. And if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So in other words, whatever we're going to do, matter of fact, I'm going to go on, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, and you had that earlier, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a, a husband that believeth not, 
if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave. You know, so we need to, we're supposed to come together, work together, bond together. It is better to marry than to burn. Um, 1 Corinthians six eighteen says, flee fornication. Because if you desire to get, let's be honest, if you're going to live on this earth, you got two choices. Uh, um, you, you, you're either going to get married or you're going to be a eunuch for the kingdom. If you can't be a eunuch for the kingdom, and Jesus himself said this is a hard thing for people to understand, if you can't be a eunuch for the kingdom, you're going to have fornication. So the Bible says flee fornication. Find someone that you both agree you're going to stay together. You're going to work this thing out. You're going to now honor God. You're going to ask God for forgiveness for your past sins and because you didn't know better. And now that you know, you're going to walk in the light. Now, there are some rules. You do not remarry the person that you divorced. You know what I mean? It's, it's in Deuteronomy. I think it's in Deuteronomy where, where – or where you, you marry somebody, you let them go, they marry somebody else, that that didn't work out, and you'll come back together. The Bible says that should never happen. You don't spread wickedness back around like that. You, you know, you don't you don't marry, you, you don't have your wife, and then let her find you're in love with her sister and marry her. You don't do that wickedness, the Bible says. So there are stipulations in this remarriage thing. Um, we do know that Abraham got remarried. He remarried Keturah. He, he married Keturah. But there are things that we need to do to be clean before the Lord. We cannot play with the marriage. Flee fornication, the Bible says. We just read. So we have to be pure and righteous before God. God will wink at our ignorance, but he will not condone known sins. So you need to be sure that when you want to get remarried, you are not playing around, especially since now you are admitting that you know better. I hope that answers some questions. We have about uh, 10 minutes left, uh, Brian, just so you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was my best answer right there, brother. Um, there are very little um, biblical examples. Uh, you know, there are remarriages in the Bible. There are those who marry again. Um, and God does seem to bless a few people that, but as a whole, that is not God's idea. So I understand if you want to live on this earth, you know, if you cannot be the eunuch, for the kingdom, be serious about the one you're about to marry because you do not have time to be lost playing games with God. The Bible also says that um, that fornication is a sin against your own body. So, you know, you don't have time to be causing your own self personal sins. Not when heaven is the goal. Not when righteousness is the key. And not when our lives are supposed to be a reflection of, of the marriage ceremony with, with Christ himself. So we don't have time for anything else. So think diligently. Be very, very careful in these next steps. Because now, when ignorance is gone, God is definitely watching and taking notes. A uh, comment just came in and says, uh, thank you. It does answer the question. All right. And praise be the Lord on that one. Um, now, we have 10 minutes, and I hate to rush. I, I, I really do. Um, so I'd just like to invite us back next week with the Inspirited Network as we continue on the, um, the 17 points of marriage. We'll begin with number 10. That will give us, um, you know, uh, 10 to 17 things to go over. But let me leave you with this with this thought. Jesus is coming back to get his bride. He's coming back to marry his bride, and we are invited to the marriage supper. If Jesus is taking a marriage ceremony so seriously that he's coming back for a pure representation, 
of him. How much more so is marriage important on the earth to reflect what God's idea is to man? The Bible says this, that he wishes, according to John chapter 17, he wishes that we would be one as he and the Father are one. We read earlier, Genesis chapter 2, and reiterated in Matthew 19 that, that for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave, become cut into and become one with his wife. And Jesus says to make it plain, now they are no more two or twain, but now they are one flesh. We're supposed to be connected in the marriage ceremony. Satan desires for us to lose out on the image of God. Satan desires for us to lose out on the benefits of blessings that come from proper marriage union, that come from a family structure that's whole, from even being in the presence of God himself. So he disrupts the marriage with all kind of foolishness and things that we think are pleasurable for, for a moment, and then we lose out on the eternal glory or the eternal weight that God has for us. So we have to look at this marriage issue as something serious because look at, look, look at what we see in the news. Every five minutes, somebody's coming out the closet. Every few minutes, there's some kind of scandal or some kind of a breakdown in the marriage. Every few minutes, people are killing each other in the home because the marriage, the family umbrella has been broken. And it's not by accident. This thing is a plan to destroy marriage. And God desires that, if nothing else, we love one another, that we give people hope that if we hold on to each other, marriage is something great and special. Nobody spends all this money on weddings just to end up in divorce. It just doesn't make sense. Let us look to God for his ideas, for his way of thinking, and then we will see success in our marriages success in our homes, success in our communities, because we're reflecting him properly. And then we can see blessings come upon us. Amen. So with that said, any other feedback? Yeah. I think a comment's coming in. Hold on. I believe that uh, marriage here should be a prototype of the great marriage celebration up in heaven. I can't wait for the next week for more on the topic. It's a pity I joined late. Amen. Amen. Uh, All I can say is amen. Because... um, if we're not ready for the marriage, the, the marriage supper, everything else, everything else is truly a waste. Everything else is truly a waste, and the marriage supper, the marriage idea, is one of the um, long-standing symbols you find in the Bible. It's not some accidental stuff. You always see God connecting us through fidelity to Him, fidelity, trust, loyalty, um, respect to Him, and the Bible says both in chapter 21 of Revelation and in chapter 22, that outside the kingdom, outside the gate, are dogs, are murderers, are liars, and whoremongers. There will be no fornication in the kingdom. So with that note, let's pray, and we'll close out, and God willing, we'll have you all guys here again next week. You know, and we pray that things go well for you during this week and that you'll be inspired um, to not only continue to study but to seek God and put him first in all your business, especially our marriages. Let us bow our heads. Amen. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you. We, we, we thank you for the fact that we can have this time that we can join together and study where uh, land and sea differences don't even matter. We're plugged in and connected, and by your grace we're being moved. Lord, we ask that you please bless the Inspirited Network. You please bless every family that has called in. Bless our marriages. Bless our homes. Bless our, our touch in our communities and in our jobs so that people can see our connection to you. 
Until we meet again next week, Lord, guide us and keep us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, thank you for coming, everyone, and have a great evening. And uh, we pray that uh, you'll return again next week. And, uh, you know, if you know anyone who would like to come, uh, we would appreciate, you know, you can send them an invitation and invite them to come enjoy the Word of God with us. 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 Come enjoy the Word of God with us.